This episode of the Future of Work podcast is brought to you by ServiceNow. Today's workforce expects consumer-grade service experiences, but HR is too busy manually responding to repetitive employee inquiries, leading to lengthy resolution times and frustrated workers. With ServiceNow, you make service delivery more efficient for HR and provide fast, personalized employee service, even for cases that require action from other departments. This year, Forbes also named ServiceNow the world's number one most innovative company. I've also personally known Pat Waters, who's the chief talent officer at ServiceNow for several years, and I'm always impressed and inspired by the work she's doing in the HR space. According to their CEO, John Donahoe, not only is ServiceNow helping to make the world of work work better for people, but they're leading by example in using their own technology and platform to drive a truly digital and employee-centric experience within their organization. You can learn more by visiting servicenow.com forward slash HR. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter to get access to the podcast episodes right when they are released, along with transcripts, free training videos I create, and a bunch of other fun stuff. You can do that at thefutureorganization.com forward slash newsletter. One of the things that we try to do, and I try to do in particular, is to tell people that you don't let the world happen to you. You have a choice. You control your career more than anything else. And we, you know, we know that people don't necessarily go to one organization and stay a lifetime anymore. We know that isn't the way. We know it especially isn't the way amongst uh, young lawyers in, in, in the legal profession. But what I try to show people is if this is an opportunity you want, unlike other big firms, there may be a place for you. And and, and we, we purposely hire less uh, first year lawyers to create more opportunities for the ones that that click and, 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 and really want to stay. But the, the key point is don't let your career happen to you. You have a choice. If you are proactive, you can really control uh, many of the uh, elements of your career. That's Andrew Glincher, CEO and managing partner at Nixon Peabody, one of the largest law firms in the world. They have 16 offices and over 700 attorneys. Nixon Peabody isn't an ordinary law firm, and Andrew isn't your typical CEO. In fact, as you will hear in today's discussion, Andrew is simply not content with the traditional ways that law firms are used to operating. He and his team at Nixon Peabody are finding ways to increase collaboration, change the way they think about space, encourage leaders to be empathetic listeners, and use technology to be more efficient and productive. You will also hear Andrew's take on how to deal with people who are resistant to change and his advice to leaders who are looking to change their workspace design. I try and ask questions. I try to understand um, my folks, uh, what motivates them, what's going on in their lives, what's important. I try to get suggestions from them as to how they think we can improve our business. Uh, I, I try and make sure we're all on the same page. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemies, get in our own way. We can create obstacles that maybe don't exist just because, uh, you know, we're, we're only seeing things from one perspective. I don't pretend to know all the answers. Uh, I've always tried to be, and I hope I'm viewed uh, as a humble leader. This is Jacob Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Welcome to the Future of Work podcast, where every week I speak with C-level executives, business leaders, and authors to explore how the workplace is changing and what the future of work is going to look like. The goal of this show is to give you the insights, the ideas, and the inspiration to help future-proof your career and your organization. If you want to get access to more content, such as podcast transcriptions, and information on working with me or having me keynote your next event, you can visit thefutureorganization.com. If you get a few seconds, please rate the podcast on iTunes or whatever your preferred channel is. 
It really helps the show, and I personally appreciate it since the podcast does take quite a bit of effort to produce. In case you are interested in sponsoring the podcast or working with me, my email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Lastly, I launched a new community called The Future If, which is a network of business leaders, authors, and futurists, some of whom are podcast guests, who explore what our future can look like if certain technologies, ideas, approaches, and trends actually happen. Each week, we explore a new topic, which ranges from autonomous vehicles, AI and automation, leadership and management, biohacking, and anything and everything in between. If you want help figuring out hype from reality and are interested in having deeper conversations about the future, then I encourage you to visit thefutureif.com. Thanks for coming along on this journey, and I hope you enjoy the Future of Work podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. My guest today is Andrew Glincher, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Partner at Nixon Peabody LLP. Andrew, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here, Jacob. So for people who might not know Nixon Peabody LLP, why don't we start off with a little bit of information about the company? What do you guys do? How big are you? All of that sort of fun stuff. Uh, good stuff. We are a law firm. Uh, we have 16 offices. We're uh, one of the largest law firms in the world. I think uh, number 70, the 70th largest on the AMLAW list. Um, we have international alliances throughout the world, uh, particularly in Asia. In the United States, uh, our, our major metro offices are located in Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, and San Francisco. Uh, we have about 700 attorneys and 1,500 total colleagues and teammates. Um, we are a, a, a we do almost everything, uh, except we do not do uh, criminal defense work, except why call it. We do not do personal injury work uh, on the plaintiff side, and we do not do divorce work. Except for those three items, um, we do everything, particularly uh, excel and have large teams in corporate real estate, labor and employment. Um, we do white collar crime, commercial litigation. Uh, in intellectual property, we have big practices, and, and so most everything that you would think of um, when you would encounter a full-service uh, law firm. Makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm sure everybody listening has in some way interacted with or worked with lawyers or law firms, so uh, I typically don't get that many law professionals on the podcast. So it's going to be very interesting to get your perspectives on uh, on some of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, what about you? Maybe you can give us a little bit of background information about you. Uh, from what I understand, you were at the law firm for a while. Uh, how did you get involved with all this? And what does a day look like for you? Oh, okay. Uh, I started here 30 years ago. Um, and I feel like I've been at five different law firms, given the amount of change in our business and our industry. I'm a first generation college graduate. I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts, a blue collar city. I studied business at Boston College undergraduate and always prided myself in being uh, as much a business person as, as a lawyer. I ran my own snack bar and concession in high school, was very entrepreneurial, worked in business in between business school and law school, and then went to law school, came out of law school, initially went to work for a small firm for about a year and a half because I really wanted to do business and commercial real estate. They told me I could do that, and all of the large firms wanted me to do commercial litigation. And ended up uh, not doing so much business in real estate and did more commercial litigation and bankruptcy at the small firm. So I went to this very large firm of PB and Brown that was 60 lawyers at the time, considered a large firm and said I would stay a year and help pay off my student loans because I financed 100% of my education. So 
every year I would uh, stay, I would say I was, you know, doing this job a year at a time. And then when I was asked to be CEO eight years ago, uh, one of my partners said to me, you know, I appreciate that you take the job a year at a time, but really that's sort of destabilizing. So if while you're CEO, maybe you don't say that. So I haven't really said that at, at this point. Before I did that, I uh, ran the Boston office, uh, which is our largest for seven years, and uh, have been very blessed with uh, to have a large corporate and uh, commercial real estate client uh, 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 base. So I, I've had a lot of fun. Uh, I always thought that I would run a business. Clients have asked me to go uh, help and run their businesses. Uh, which I've turned down over the years, and uh, I never thought that I, the business I would run would be a, a uh, you know international offer. It sounds like a pretty cool uh, cool thing to be doing. Uh, and as the CEO, do you have a a typical day, or or what does your your time at the law firm look like? Well, um, there is no typical day. I am never bored. Uh, I would say everybody told me when I started that our business was extremely complicated. Uh, our business is not very complicated. I'd like to say it was because maybe it could make this position sound more important. Uh, the only thing complicated is is your people and, and, and working with your talent. I'm blessed to work with extremely smart, motivated, intellectually curious, and because they're lawyers, skeptical people. Um, and, uh, you know, working with people and understanding how you can help your colleagues and how you can work with them, how you can make them better. I view my job as helping people succeed. And I try and do everything possible in helping to build our teams and to serve our clients and to add value to our clients uh, to help our folks succeed. And part of that is uh, trying to be the law firm of the future. Part of that is never taking ourselves too seriously, take our clients seriously, but we don't take ourselves and to have fun doing what we're doing. Um, we're not your typical law firm. Uh, we do enjoy working with each other. Our clients have noted that. Uh, they've said that that's why they like working with us is because we actually like each other. For me, it's hard to imagine ever working in a place where I didn't really like and care about the people uh, I work with. That would be, uh, you know, that would not be a good job for me uh, because people, the people part is just so important. Our assets are very different. If you're talking to, you know, the CEO of Procter & Gamble, for example, you know, they might talk to you about their Gillette division and, 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 and shaving and razor blades. And maybe their biggest challenge is the millennials because millennials don't like to shave and Harry Shave Club because they've eaten away a little bit in their in their business. Um, my biggest assets are people and my people are I describe them as elevator assets. They can go home every single day. And they have to choose and want to come back here because everybody that works here could go get a job somewhere else and do and do very well. They're all very talented. And so these elevator assets have to return. And uh, I think working with people, um, valuing each people and uh, each person and their contribution as a member of our team uh, and, and keeping people going in the right direction so that they're successful, uh, that's the the day to day challenges. I mean, you get into some business and more mundane things like budgets and and planning and talent management. Uh, like any other business, we we are our second highest cost uh, besides our people is our real estate, uh, which I'm hoping will become less and less important um, in the in the future as the world becomes more virtual virtual and uh, the boundaries lessen. You mentioned uh, something that I find interesting, which is that um, at your law firm, people actually like working with each other. And I feel like this stereotypical law firm that a lot of people are used to and are familiar with is the one where everyone's competing, everyone's fighting, people don't like each other, it's very conservative. 
And so I'm really curious from your perspective, how has the law firm changed? So, I mean, if you were to look back 30 years when you first joined, um, what were law firms like and, and how and why are they changing? That's a great question, Jacob. Um, 30 years ago, uh, law firms were more a bunch of solo practitioners working together, people with different skills. Maybe they complement one another. They, people would do what they did best, and perhaps maybe they'd bring in somebody else uh, if they didn't have the expertise, but that was not the norm. Uh, law firms, you're right when you say that you view law firms as a competitive environment and, 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 and people, it's, it's a lot of individual competitions. I would say that was the way uh, when I started. And um, unfortunately, that is the way with many law firms still today. People are, are, are siloed and they're competing against the folks they work with. I would say the only competition, to the extent there is one, most folks' competition, my competition's always been with myself. I, I'm not looking to be better than uh, Jill next door or Joe on the other side. I, I'm looking at my own personal bar, what I can do better in terms of helping people. And, and you're right in your observation that things have been individual in many firms, uh, historically in most firms, I believe in uh, hugely in collaboration and that the better that you can collaborate and, and work with one another, that means the better team you're going to field. If, that, if you can field a team, a really great team, and surround yourself with people who are strong where you may not be, uh, you're better. If you can field a diverse team, you're the best because you'll bring many different perspectives to what you're doing. Those perspectives will be unique. They will challenge you and you'll end up with the best result for your client. And the best thing about working together, which I found, you know, even my job today and my job as a practicing attorney where I was probably most noted for the teams that I built uh, was it's a lot of fun. And when you get to do what you like to do and what you're good at. And there's generally a, co a correlation between what you're good at and what you like to do. Like I love to negotiate and in part because that's dealing with people and I like to build consensus. And that's part of, I think, a successful negotiation. Uh, the negotiations that I'm involved with, the win-win, it's not that I win and somebody else loses. It's how do you find common ground? How do you build consensus to solve problems, whether it be to, to create solutions in our law firm, but to create solutions for clients. And, and to me, that has been the most fun in the practice of law and in the business of law, which I'm now more involved in, is to work with great people and work with teams and to get the most out of folks. Collaboration, I think, in any business is important. I think it is crucial to the success of major law firms. And, and the better that people collaborate, the better their networks are internally and externally will determine, I think, individual success. And I think it will determine uh, long term firm success. How are uh, things changing? Um, so when you look at uh, the law firm of the future, uh, I know that you guys have been doing some interesting things over at Nixon Peabody. But you mentioned collaboration, our leadership styles changing, office spaces, uh, our, our law firms becoming just kind of like, uh, I don't know, Silicon Valley startups in some way? Well, when, when I started as CEO eight years ago, I encouraged people to step out of their comfort zone. I encouraged people, everybody would say, this is how we've always done it. And I would say, Forget about it. Make believe that I'm giving you the choice of doing this any way you want to do it. How would you do that? Now, for lawyers and 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 even you know our our, our many and 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 able staff, uh, that was something new because law firms as a whole are generally very conservative, and their business has been based and the practice of law has been based on precedent. What has happened before? Now, if you're only looking 
as to what's happened before, you're not really looking at the future. So changing that mindset, while not ignoring precedent, was crucial to our success. Precedent is important in terms of actual case law when you're helping clients. Precedent as to how you run a business, how you operate your business, how you effectively serve your customers is, is not so important. You need that's where you need to think out of the box, where you need to come up with new solutions, new ideas as to how you're doing that. And and part of the challenge, Jacob, you alluded to the collaboration piece, which is spot on. Part of that challenge is, you know, if you walked around law firms and I'm in an office right now and I'm going to be moving offices come January. But the office I'm sitting in right now, the only glass is on the windows outside. Otherwise, I'm surrounded by walls and a wood door. And that effectively, when my door is shut and even when it's open, shuts me out from from people. And picture having hundreds of those offices that people sit in that shut them out from 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 their colleagues. So a couple things. One, I'm not really big on hierarchies. I'm really, I, I believe in treating people equally. The same respect, you treat people fairly. I don't like hierarchies. I know that sounds very weird coming from a CEO. I don't particularly, I get uncomfortable when people call me boss, even though most of the time I think they mean it with respect. But I believe we're all in this together, and and, and that, uh, in no way am I trying to get away from my duty to lead. But I, I, I like to approach this as a as a team sport. But if you're working together, you got to break down those walls, and and part of our you know you have to break down the silos. And I think part of effective collaboration begins not only with with doing it, but how are you going to do it? How are you going to create an exciting environment to better collaborate? I thought the best way to do that was to have one size offices, uh, to do it with glass and to make it very open and collaborative. And we tried it. And I will say it was very new. We first tried it in Washington, D.C. I had some resistance. Um, and then we were able to do it in Los Angeles, in New York. We're building out our offices right now in Boston to move in in January and San Francisco to move in in, J- in this January as well. Again, single size glass offices. And it what we have found is there's even more buzz with people working together. You see one another. We have reduced the amount of space, even though we have the same people by a third, which is good because pe- more people are together. We have a lot of open space uh, with cafes and collaboration space. We've taken all of the corners away. So no more partner corner offices. The corners are all now collaboration rooms. You can call them a conference room, collaboration room. And we have areas where people are naturally together collaborating, talking with one another. Because the more you know about your colleagues and what they do, the more helpful you can be uh, both internally and also externally to provide value to your clients and customers because informally you gather so much information. Just being around people and, and connecting with people, it might seem obvious to folks in the business world, but in the legal world, people weren't doing that and they're still resisting it. Some uh, Many successful law firms still, they ask me, the, their managing partners and CEOs will ask me, you know, how did you do this? Our partners won't do it. We had to give them the bigger offices. We, you know, we could do more glass, but they needed their bigger offices and I couldn't fight that battle. And, you know, I won't say there wasn't any resistance and, and I'm a, I'd like to think of myself, and I think if you ask people, uh, my colleagues' opinions, which are more important than mine, how they thought of my leadership, I would hope they would say it's consensus building and and collaborative. Uh, So I didn't force anything on anybody. And I would say, you know, the only resistance I ever had was, you know, a couple folks initially said, I need to have my bigger office. And we talked a couple times, and I said, well, if you're not going to feel uncomfortable having a bigger office than the rest of your colleagues, 
then, you know, I, I guess if that's the only way you can work here, then that's what you're going to have to do. And I will let you know what the additional cost is and we'll just take it out of your monthly paycheck. Well, after that discussion, nobody asked for a bigger office. I don't know why, but nobody asked. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine, especially in the in the law space. Uh, I mean, I heard stories, not even just in law, but in general, that people used to count the, the tiles on the ceiling, and then that's how you could judge your success, because the more tiles, the bigger the office, and... Uh, and then it used to be that's looking exactly at, right. And then the material that the desk was made out of, like if it was a higher end mm-hmm. wood. So you experienced all that sort of stuff yourself. Absolutely. You're 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 right. People did used to count the ceiling tiles to figure out who had a bigger office. They looked at the quality of the wood of the leather. Not only is everyone going to have the same office, but everyone's going to have the same furniture and everybody has the same furniture in their offices. And you know where else that helps? You often want to move people and you get resistance and people say, well, my furniture won't fit here, won't fit there. Um, There's no issue now. You just move the person. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I guess for other people listening to this that maybe are not, uh, well, and it's probably the majority of people not working at a law firm, but still very much in in a similar situation like you guys are where they're thinking about making changes to space. Uh, How did you justify the rationale for why you should do that? Uh, And for people listening, what would you tell them as far as advice for how to do it? I, I think that everything that we do is to serve our clients. I don't pretend to ever have all of the answers. I have found that our success is directly related to our client success. If you want to have great client success, then you need to provide your clients with great value. You need to think ahead. What we, what I have always told folks as a business person is you need to invest on your own dime and learn your client's business and industry. And you need to do that. So the whole value proposition and the collaboration and the fact that our clients and people that work with us on the other side of transactions and and litigation matters have noticed how well we work together. Uh, That entire part is what I emphasize. It's one thing for us to think something, but when we're doing market surveys and independent surveys of industry leaders, consultants, and other law firms and people we work with, and the feedback we get is it's amazing you know, how much people like each other and like working with each other. I then can take that information and data that's far more useful, the external feedback than the internal feedback and say, listen, look at these surveys. They all have different themes in them. And and we need to play to our strengths and play off those um, strengths that are perceived by the marketplace. And, and, and in particular, that are noted by our clients, because without our clients, we have nothing. We're, we're, here to, we're here to serve and effectively serve our clients. So I believe morale's better. I've spent a lot of time um, you know, speaking to um, millennials, things, diversity, inclusion, things like that. I think this helps us. It makes us better. In, 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 in some of the work styles, I think we need to be open and, and, and be realistic that people are not using office space today in the same way as they did in the past, and they're going to use it to a lesser degree in the future. Um, there is more, fo- more folks uh, working remotely. There are more folks in a large firm that, you know, spans our, our, our geographies. There are more folks working in other offices or working at clients. And, you know, I tell people if we don't have this space where we're all together and, and working, you want to have that vibrancy. And I think everybody has noticed going around to Washington, D.C. office, going into our L.A. office, into our New York City office, they see this vibrancy, this energy, and it becomes contagious. And that has helped me sell each successive office. And our clients love it, too. It's, it's very 
it, it, it's very comfortable. There's a lot of common space. It's not, you know, this isn't over the top, the wood, stuffy wood and marble. It's very down to earth. There are, you know, there's, there's coffee machines, there's fruit, there's refreshments, there's, there's open space. There are some game tables. Uh, there's a, you know, we have live walls with plants and, and, and it, it's just very, very comfortable like you would want in your home. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty cool place to work. And, and I like that you mentioned uh, comfortable like you would have in your home because I think that's a big shift that we're seeing is uh, organizations are kind of becoming a little bit like home in some ways. So it's it's good that you're kind of they adapting are. to that. Uh, they are. And, 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 and leaders today are very different and leadership needs to be very different than it was. The, the, everyone's, you know, the style today is very different than uh, you know, to, at least in my opinion, one person's opinion, uh, the style needed today and, and w how you work, where you work, how you lead, uh, is very different than historically. Yeah, absolutely. And we're definitely going to talk on, uh, talk about some of that as well. Uh, but you mentioned you had some people that were resisting change. And again, I think that's something that's very common across all organizations. Whenever you introduce something new, whether it's new offices or new technologies or programs, you always get people that are like, eh, I prefer my uh, closed door office, you know, where nobody can see me. So how did you deal with people who were resistant to that change? Is there anything particular that you did, uh, any advice that you can give to people listening who are struggling with that as well? Well, some of the things I do is to show them companies um, that aren't faring well, uh, who've, who have resisted change and what's happening to them uh, and how that they're not, you need to stay relevant. I mean, I'm, you know, I have 30 years experience, so I, I spend a lot of time trying to stay relevant to our multiple generational workforce. And, you know, it's very easy to see companies like BlackBerry, right, which had half of the cell phone, the smartphone market just years ago. And, and today they uh, have 1% and it's reduced, you know, pretty much to a software company. Take a look at a company like Sears um, and, and what's happening, you know, what's happening there. Y you have to change. You don't have a choice but to change. And I think the way I talk to people and we have discussions about changes, I acknowledge and I'm very empathetic that change is difficult. But without change, um, we we have no ability uh, to uh, adapt and be successful in the future. And we've had people, we've convinced people to, to change and to try different things and they see the success. And I'm very grateful because you wouldn't think that Lawyers as a whole would embrace change, uh, but I would say my colleagues have been much more open and receptive to change than I I would have ever imagined, and and they're willing to try new things and do new things. And and part of the thing about trying new things is you have to, in order to encourage people to try new things, you can't be punitive when they fail. And you, 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 you have to keep encouraging people to, to do things. And maybe they work and maybe they don't. We're not in the business of saving lives where, you know, that isn't our business. If we, if we were, if we were trying to save lives and we we're trying different things that didn't work and people died, that's horrible. But we're not. We're trying to figure out how to take a very good business and a good service model um, and, and be just as relevant in the future to our clients as we are today, if not more so. And we're in a field that the demand, uh, you know, to the top hundred law firms in the world overall has been relatively flat. So the only way you increase your business, which we've had the great success of doing, is to is bluntly to take it away from your competitors. So if you're not changing and offering more value to your clients, then you're going to be less less competitive. So, you know, we, we do encourage that. I had my annual meeting with partners and it was, you know, it was an interesting message. We've had 
phenomenal success compared to other firms. So I, I needed to congratulate and thank my partners. That was the first thing that I had to do and, and, and show appreciation for the great job that they've done. And it's always, you know, I find it always important. You can never show too much appreciation and gratitude, uh, you know, to your colleagues. Uh, but then to say to them, we've had a lot of this success because we've been willing and, 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 and open to change. And even though we're doing great, we need to still be open to change. And we still have to think about how we want to do things in the future. I mean, we were one of the first law firms, if not the first, I think we were the first eight years ago, I appointed a chief innovation officer. And I just, uh, he retired and did a phenomenal job. And now I appointed a, a new 30 something chief innovation officer. And uh, the whole idea, you know, the, the chief innovation officer, we form a, a committee of people around the firm and uh, they're folks that are really big thinkers outside the box. And we want to keep trying new, uh, you know, new things. And uh, you have to encourage that. You can't stand still. There's no business today that you can stand still and, and, and take anything for granted. And you want people to be excited about what they do. And people aren't going to be excited about doing the same old thing, especially, you know, next gen talent. They want they want to have control and, and to understand that they can make a difference of working at a law firm. It's much more than a business. You need a soul. You need a social identity. You need to be part of the fabric of the community. And you need to show folks that. And one of the things that we try to do and I try to do in particular is to tell people that you don't let the world happen to you. You have a choice. You control your career more than anything else. And we, you know, we know that people don't necessarily go to one organization and stay a lifetime anymore. We know that isn't the way. We know it especially isn't the way amongst uh, young lawyers in, in, in the legal profession. But what I try to show people is if this is an opportunity you want, unlike other big firms, there may be a place for you. And, and, and we, we purposely hire less uh, first year lawyers to create more opportunities for the ones that, that click and, 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 and really want to stay. But the, the key point is don't let your career happen to you. You have a choice. If you are proactive, you can really control uh, many of the uh, elements of your career. And now let's take 90 seconds to hear from our sponsor, ServiceNow, and their chief talent officer, Pat Waters. Every company has an employee experience, those intentional and those organically created. For CHRO, you start by crafting your vision and you look at those moments that matter. They look at what is the business problem or opportunity they're trying to achieve and they craft their talent strategies to not only achieve that goal, but actually to set themselves apart differentially in the marketplace to attract great talent. What I like to look at with my peers is how do you automate the processes that are repetitive? How do you create insights into tools and technology that allow me to think ahead, not two steps, maybe five steps? How do we create tools that create less friction for me as an employee that makes me free up opportunity and time to do things that I love to do. That is changing the way people do work. CHROs are helping redefine how talent works today. The benefits of intentionally crafting an employee experience is high. It's retention, it's engagement, it's better productivity, it's unlocking discretionary effort. So if you free up some of my time, you know, and I'm excited about my job and my work and collaborating, then I'm gonna use that extra cycle to help others be successful. If you don't do that, you will lose that talent that you crafted for such a long time. The most successful CHROs today are looking around the corners and I can't wait to see what they find. If you wanna learn more, please visit servicenow.com forward slash HR. And now back to the podcast. And I'm definitely going to ask you a couple of questions about that as well, because I think there's a lot um, lot to unpack there for people listening. Uh, but you mentioned something a couple minutes ago, which was that even your clients notice that you guys like working with each other. 
And so are the changes that you're making internally, are you seeing a reflection on that as far as, I don't know, revenue, performance, uh, feedback from your customers and clients? Are they recognizing these changes that you're doing or, or how do you see the value on that on the customer or the client side? That's a great question, um, Jacob. Uh, the value as perceived by our clients, our clients come in, they see the offices, they, they love them. I, I host uh, I host roundtables with other managing partners from many other firms. They've come in. I've had managing partners from other firms wanting tours of our office before they do their own space. So people are seeing it and people are following it. The clients like it. Uh, they they like somewhat too, I would say, not only the openness and the collaboration, uh, you need to understand they've been doing that for many years. A lot of them, it's been their professional service firms maybe haven't kept up as much. Like we, we may have been the first U.S. law firm to build out large offices uh, or one of the first uh, of the same size. But there have been other professional, I'm sure accounting firms have, have done it and uh, certainly other businesses. So they see it. And I think one of the things clients like, too, is, you know, clients often think, when they come in, they'll look at it and they're like, so this is what I'm paying for, right? If I'm a client, I might walk in and say, well, this marble's nice and this wood and um, everything and these huge offices and, you know, boy, they serve really nice food and, and, and drink. <laughs> and uh, am I paying for this? Are they charging me for this? Is it that we don't charge our clients, obviously, for this. But, you know, perceptions are a funny thing. And, and people look at it. And I think that People come in and clients that come in, they're like, wow, you've really made the most of this footprint. Wow, you, you haven't wasted anything. Um, you, 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 I can't believe that everybody's agreed to the same size office. That's so, so cool. Uh, so they come in and they look at all of that and they say, you've done more with less. And, 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 and I think they're pretty impressed by that. And, and it's not like, we, you know, this... This is, we have nice space. You know, I won't apologize for our space. It's a working environment. People um, work there, but it's not over the top, ornate, in your face, marble, you know, all of that. It's, 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 it's very comfortable, like you might put, um, you know, in, 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 in your home and, 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 and just feel, you know, a, a, a sense of comfort. So they've seen it. Now, our performance has outperformed our peer firms uh, materially in a, in a major way over the last several years, and we're doing extremely well. You asked, can, you know, how much, you know, can you tie any performance improvement to what we're doing? And I would say I'm sure some of it's tied. It, it, is, it is a difficult thing, though, if you ask me to prove how that was correlated. I don't know that I can, but the, I can look at a few things. One is um, morale is really, really good. Um, two, uh, at, at the partner and staff level in particular, we have almost virtually no unwanted attrition. Um, associates, you know, I think associate level, we do better than most firms in terms of attrition, but associates come and, and, and associates, you know, associates can decide they want to do something else. You know, where you get people out of school, it's their first job. Um, sometimes they may want to continue with a big firm. Sometimes they may want to go in house. Sometimes they might say, you know, I don't know if I want to be a lawyer. I might want to go teach. Um, but in terms of our unwanted turnover, it's amongst the lowest in the industry. It's it's almost mind boggling. We have these 10 year lunches to celebrate people who have been here 10 years. And it's like 90 plus percent of the firm. We I stopped having them because it was embarrassing how few people that weren't included. That that was more of a problem than than having all of these the celebrations. I felt bad that we'd leave out a few people. Um, so. So clearly something is, we're, we're is working. Do, we're doing, yeah, that is working. People are excited about it. Um, people, you know, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal, and it's a number of years ago. It, it it's probably goes back, I bet it goes back seven or eight years. And it was to um, support staff, administrative staff, 
And it said, and I think Har- it may have been a study at Harvard, um, and it said, if you had a choice, and it was for folks making, at the time, $40,000 a year, and if you had a choice of having a 10% raise or a really good friend at work, which would you choose? And the answer was they would choose a really good friend. And, and to me, that was eye-opening because not that friendship isn't important, but it's one thing for somebody that's making six figures, let's say, to, to say, I'll choose a really good friend because maybe they have enough money. But for somebody making maybe the, the average wage in a corporation or, or something like that and not enough to support a, a middle class family or a lower middle class family to say, I'd rather have the friend than the extra $4,000 when they need, the, you would think they need the money. And I think most of them do and live maybe paycheck to paycheck. That was eye opening. And that showed me the importance of culture and people at work. And that, you know, a lot of folks think that you just throw money at problems and that solves the problem. And it doesn't. So much is in the uh, atmosphere, the environment that you create, uh, how people are respected and and valued uh, beyond money. It doesn't mean that you don't need to pay competitively. You certainly do. Uh, It's no substitution for paying competitively. But you people value other things at work and especially, you know, workplace where we work together. Uh, these aren't individual silo jobs where we're working together and um, the, it, our business is based on on collaboration. So it's just amazing to me. And what it does as well is beyond having an environment of great respect, like you'll never hear anyone raise their voice. There are no orders given. Uh, you know, we're all in this, you know, we really are in this together. People, I think that's why part of the reason people like coming here. Um, it's, 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 it's been very gratifying for me to see because it, it, it just shows that we have this, um, identity and culture and, 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 and soul, something beyond just a business that's successful because it makes money, but we're successful because of how we treat our people and how we treat and live in our communities. Well, clearly whatever you're doing over there seems to be working. Uh, but I wanted to shift gears a little bit because there's also been a lot of talk, uh, as far as the impact that technology might have on jobs and careers, uh, we hear this a lot in like the tax space for, you know, the big accounting firms on there, but even in law firms a little bit too, there have been some conversations about this as well. Uh, what's your general, um, I guess just your thoughts on the role that technology and AI might play in the future and the impact they might have on jobs or careers. Are you worried about that? Are you optimistic? Are you seeing it happen at all today? Um, yes. I mean, technology plays a great role uh, in, in our business. Uh, they have played a role for, uh, you know, for a very long time. We give people the equipment that they need to succeed. We have opened up, we've had everything from laptops and uh, we have people that have a laptop, a, 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 a uh, iPad, uh, iPhones, whatever they need in terms of technology to work from wherever they happen to be. Like my office, since I have 16 offices and I'm expected to travel and visit people uh, on a regular basis, my office is wherever I am. And my iPhone and iPad is what I've used since it came out eight years ago. And I find it hard to believe that I can basically run our business using uh, those two tools. Uh, so very, very important um, and very important that we continue to spend and invest. And we've spent millions uh, to do that. Artificial intelligence is uh, not, nothing new. Advancements in technology aren't new. They've been changing our business for decades. Um, and artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think, are basically two examples. Uh, they really have a positive impact on how we practice. And uh, we constantly need to figure out 
and to address how we can use technology uh, to benefit our clients. Makes sense. So you guys are definitely thinking about technology, but it, it also sounds like you're seeing more kind of a positive outlook for it instead of uh, you know some of the doom and gloom stuff, which is great. Um, it is, yeah, it is positive. You're right. The outlook is positive. It isn't uh, doom and gloom. It's really a, a tool that can contribute to our success, and you know you have to embrace it. And 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 you know to it, it can make your business better. It's it makes you know you more efficient. It's the whole twenty four seven, right? You can yep. you 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 work. You have to work all at a time, uh, but you can work from anywhere. Yeah, there are pros and cons uh, as with anything uh, anything else. Uh, a couple other um, things that I really wanted to ask you about. One is around leadership, because it seems like with a lot of the changes that are going on, um, not just even in law firms, but just the companies around the world, leadership is really crucial. And so um, I really wanted to unpack your particular leadership style. So you as the CEO of your firm, uh, what's your leadership style? Is there anything that you do that you think is unique that makes you an effective leader? Uh, just so that for people listening, maybe they can apply some of these techniques or practices that you use for their own companies. Okay. Um, my leadership style is probably somewhat unique, I would say. Uh, I am uh, what you see is what you get type of person. I will... I speak with every member of our organization. I am approached constantly, sometimes in elevators. I, I walk the halls wherever I go regularly. When I go to another office, I have a ton of work to do, but I might sit in my hotel room for a couple hours early in the morning, get done what I need to get done, so then I can visit with people. Uh, so I am very approachable. I was, when I was asked to be office managing partner and manage the Boston office. Uh, the then uh, chief executive came to me and said, people really want you to do it. The good news is you're the most approachable person in the firm. The bad news is you're the most approachable person in the firm and you need to figure out you know, how to manage your time. Um, so you're not spending all of your time um, you know, meeting with people. Um, I, you know, I thought that was a bit of an overstatement, but I took it to heart. I think that one of the words you used when you just asked me the question, Jacob, was, you know, the listeners and people want to listen uh, to maybe some of the ideas that I have. There is nothing more important than being an empathetic listener. Listening is key, um, and it's very challenging sometimes to sit back and just let folks talk but that's what you need to do sometimes i've gotten better at it i think i'm a you know a really good listener now and i'm certainly have, have uh, tried to lose all my defense mechanisms and not be defensive to anything that anybody says to me and i, I what's empathetic and i think saying? i've made progress there so some oh, empathetic some, yeah yeah sorry go ahead um, if you can unpack that no em yeah. Um, I, well, I, I use the two words together, but I try and have empathy. I always try and have empathy for what the other person is going through. You know, we work very hard, but my, my dad drove a cab seven days a week, 12 hours a day. He worked very hard and he doesn't make the kind of money or didn't make the kind of money that people I work with make. So, um, you know, a lot of folks work hard. Our, our people have lives outside of uh, their jobs and you know there's a lot of stress in the world today uh the you know the environment is is uh, very different i think than it's been in the past i think technology and communication have accelerated the amount of data the amount of knowledge the amount of you know things that people hear and i think you always have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and, and think about what they're going through and think about their perceptions. Everybody, you know, you could show people a piece of paper with a picture on it, and there's been many studies, and many, you could look at that piece of paper, but people will see many different things. And I believe in lifelong learning. I try and learn things every day. I learn from the people I work with. 
I think the empathetic listening, as I described it, is just sitting back, listening carefully to what other people are saying and what they're going through and understanding and trying to appreciate uh, the perspective that they're bringing to a given situation. It doesn't really matter how I feel. It, it really matters how they feel. And, and, and you need to, as a listener, uh, get what that person is feeling. And sometimes the best way to do it is to do the opposite of what I'm doing right now. And it's not to speak and it's to have that silence. And sometimes it means even having uncomfortable silence that seems to go on for minutes, but really it's 10 seconds or 15 seconds and, and to get to what's on somebody's mind. Most people that talk to me, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of social chatter, but whether it be in the hallway or, or lunch room or wherever it might be, often they have something on their mind. They have something they want to say or ask about or something, you know, that they want an opinion on or they want to express an opinion on. So uh, it's just you, you do need to be an active listener. Well, listening to you talk, I mean, it just sounds like the whole role of leadership is changing, uh, really being more approachable, having that empathetic listening, not so much command and control. Um, so aside from the empathetic listening, are there any other particular skills or things that you practice on a regular basis to be a, a more effective leader that you think others should be practicing? I try and ask questions. I try to understand um, my folks, uh, what motivates them, what's going on in their lives, what's important. I try to get suggestions from them as to how they think we can improve our business. Uh, I, I try and make sure we're all on the same page. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemies, get in our own way. We can create obstacles that maybe don't exist just because, uh, you know, we're, we're only seeing things from one perspective. I don't pretend to know all the answers. Uh, I've always tried to be, and I hope I'm viewed um, as a humble leader. I will ask questions and try and let folks come to solutions on their own. I might have an end answer um, in mind, but I try not to suggest that because people might follow that and I'd rather them find it either on their own or come up with something different and uh, that might teach me something and, and, and change my mind and how I approach a situation. And the folks that work with me, my team knows that nobody's afraid to say anything. Sometimes, you know, people can't believe what people will say to me, uh, but I love that environment. I only work with people that are going to challenge me because I don't need folks to just tell me what I'm already thinking. I don't really learn much by that. It's like when I speak, I don't really learn much. So I, I, I have to be, I have to be listening. So, uh, I would suggest that, you know, people do that. You have to be comfortable in your own skin and people notice that. Um, and, and if you're not comfortable, aren't. a lot of people are not, they're comfortable not in their own skin. They're not. And some of the best and most talented people are not comfortable in their own skin. And, you know, you got to try and, and make them. They don't realize, you know, how much they're contributing. And that goes to the gratitude part that I said before. Um, you know, I looked up and still look up to so many of my colleagues um, and, and admire them so much. Um, and you need to tell them that. You need to uh, say that to them. You need to express it. You can't assume that just by your smiles or your actions that they get that you got to tell them what you're grateful for. You need to tell them what they're, what you think they're doing really well. Uh, so they'll replicate it and maybe mentor and teach, um, some, some other folks. But I, what surprised me, um, I think in this role was it doesn't matter what level of the, um, organization you're at. It doesn't matter how many years you've been here or how great you are at your job. Um, most people um, don't feel that greatness. They, they don't have necessarily, some people don't have the same confidence in themselves that I have in them. And so it's important that, you know, you, you do that. And obviously that has its limits. So the, the, otherwise, you, you know, you don't want to, I don't think you can have too much confidence, but 
but in our environment, um, you know, people don't, uh, there's a lot of self-deprecation. It's like I said, uh, I think at the outset, take our clients seriously, not ourselves. And, uh, you know, so, but people need to know that you recognize what they're doing and what they're doing right and is important. And if you do that as well, like we all make mistakes and can do things differently. Uh, but when you then have to talk with somebody about something that maybe isn't going well, they'll probably receive it a lot better then if the only time you're going to give them feedback is negative feedback, that doesn't work very well. Yeah. Uh, the, the other part of the feedback part, and we've, it's, uh, you know, in uh, evaluations and things we hear, and I learned this from, you know, our, our next gen and millennials, um, of which I have three in-house because I have three kids that are a millennial, all millennials. So I learned from them and their friends is that you don't, you know, the concept of how we reviewed and interacted with talent in years past is really outdated. Nobody wants you to wait six months before telling them how they did. And if you weren't happy, especially with something that was done, that just builds up before you write a review. So I have uh, implemented, encouraged, and then quickly implemented real-time feedback and formalized that, that if you work on anything with anybody uh, within the conclusion of that matter. And if you can do it simultaneously, even better, let people know how they're doing. And if there's something you want to see differently, let them know, because in our business, you have your external clients, which are most important, but you also have your internal clients because whoever you work with is a client that you're serving internally. And both of them require, uh, your exceptional service and talent. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I know we only have a couple minutes left, so uh, there may be one or two more things I wanted to touch on. Uh, one of them is sure. something that you mentioned a couple minutes ago, and you talked about this idea of people being able to shape their own careers. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a really interesting point to look at because um, I don't think we do a very good enough, uh, a, a very good job of doing that. We oftentimes assume that we have to climb a corporate ladder. The organization shapes our career. Uh, so maybe you can talk about that for a couple of minutes is how do we shape our careers uh, regardless, you know, again, if you're at a law firm or consumer packaged goods company, or even if you're just coming out of college, how do you begin to really take more control over what your career is going to look like? Um, so any advice that you have on that? Sure. Um, and, and so this is, you know, I think back on my own career and you know, I would say at the beginning, I sort of felt boxed in, um, you know, you're educating yourself and a lot of jobs today in, in law or medicine or otherwise, uh, at the beginning of your career, in large part, you're getting paid to learn, right? And you're building a, you're building a foundation. And uh, if you come out of school and, you know, you have a lot of student loans, you might feel tied to doing one thing. If you have a family and the bills start coming in, you might be, you know, feel that you, you have to do something. But putting those real life financial issues aside, you really need to understand what makes you tick. You really need to understand what is it that you want to do. And, and, and sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. In your first couple of jobs, you might see uh, more often uh, what you don't want to do. Like I, I was part of, I went to schools that gave me the most money since I was financing at 100% myself. And I went to a law school that had a cooperative legal education program, Northeastern Law School. And I chose that school because I liked the fact that I'd go to school for nine months, uh, like everybody else. And then I'd have three month co-ops that I'd get paid for. I'd work in a law firm. I worked in a, in a, a fortune 500 legal corporation, legal department, a small law firm, a large law firm. I clerked for a judge and, and I learned a lot. And sometimes what you learn in your jobs is things that you don't want to do. And it's easy to eliminate things you don't want to do. The harder thing is figuring out what, does make you tick? What do you like to do? Again, going to, str that's usually your strengths. What will make you happy in a career like law and people with a legal education? 
because you've been at one place and you don't like it, you shouldn't dismiss a career. You can use that education for so many different career paths, but it's figuring out where does your passion lie? What makes you happy? Do you, are you a person that likes working with people or you don't like working with people? Are you a person that has some sales ability? Because to a certain extent, we're all sales people. We're all, you know, presenting ourselves to, to somebody else. And, and uh, whether we're in a traditional sales role or, or not, do you like uh, what are the types of uh, functions that you do that you enjoy the most? What's the, the subject matter? that you enjoy the most, but it's, it's very introspective, but it's understanding that you can do things like we've had people come for instance, and maybe they'll start off as, as an associate, but they might say, you know, I really want to work in HR. I don't, I, I would much rather do that. And, 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 you know, what I try to do is if we have, you know, if we have good talent or something and, and they can move around and try different things and it can work if somebody's good, you know, give them that alternative. But sometimes, you know, no one's going to figure that out for you. They could tell you what you're good at and whatever, and maybe you could go to a career council and they'll help. And I used to read, I remember coming out of college, I don't know how, you know, the relevance today, I, I read a couple times when I was looking and thinking about looking at a book called, I think, What Color Is Your Parachute, uh, to, to, to take a look at that. But it, it really is, you do have control. The other thing is, sometimes you might not get all of the experience that you want to get just in your job. And that goes to the community. Like we ask people to give back to the community. We do that for a multitude of reasons. One, it's the right thing. People that work here are blessed. They have good jobs. They've been educated. Um, they have reasonably, you know, hopefully they have good lives. Uh, but there are so many others that are less fortunate. And I want people to keep a broad perspective. And so keeping a broad perspective means you don't just sit in a law office all day long and, and, and work with clients and see, uh, you know, see this view of life. You need to do something else. We ask everybody to donate a certain amount of hours to pro bono. We ask everybody to be active in their communities. So you might say, what does that have to do with what people want to do? It does a couple of things. One, it puts perspective on the job that they do day to day. But the other thing it does is it exposes them to other areas and, and they can see how they as people can help other people that are let, you know, that are, that are less fortunate. They can utilize and gain experience in different skills or skill sets that they might not get in their day to day job. All of that is extremely valuable. So the more of that that you can do, if you can balance externally, internally, like when I was and, and you know, being a lawyer, a practicing lawyer is really busy. So it's hard to find time. But I did a couple of things. One, I loved I was greatly influenced by my grandmother. I love working with seniors and I did a lot of work with seniors and, and, and senior housing organizations and the volunteered for 30 years in various roles. Sometimes I would spend as much as 10 hours a week or more in, in, in some of those roles. The other thing is I really love mentoring and teaching uh, younger people. So for 23 years, I taught in the, the business school at Boston College. Uh, and I purposely taught in the business school and not the law school because I wanted to stay relevant um, in business. But mentoring that teaches mentoring, working with other folks, listening to them, keeping fresh ideas and perspectives. So if you can't figure it out on your own, what you want to do by doing other things uh, that are more selfless, in, in the community and, and, and getting involved either in volunteer activities or, 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 or doing things like teaching or coaching your, you know, maybe your child's uh, team or, or volunteering at school or doing something um, is going to give you that perspective and greater objectivity and maybe an understanding of what makes you tick. I think that's fantastic advice uh, and actually a perfect way to wrap up. Um, the last few questions I have are just really rapid fire, fun questions about you. Uh, just so people can get to <laughs> they learn They won't you. be fun. Oh, they'll be fun. They're always fun. Uh, so the, the first one is, what do you think has been your greatest business failure? My greatest business failure? 
or mistake? <sighs> One mistake. I would say um, you worry about things that never happen. I'm a worrier. Um, and, you know, you, you just you, you worry about things that never happen. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, maybe be more risk averse. Although that's not my profession, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's been your most embarrassing moment at work? <laughs> so my most embarrassing moment at work, um, I have suffered from chronic back pain and uh, need to move around uh, and get up and try and walk around a lot. I do a lot of stretches and yoga and try to exercise a lot. And I was in the middle of a a uh, pretty intense negotiation on behalf of a client and my back was killing me. So I needed to get up and I got up and the other side uh, that we were negotiating with thought I was leaving the room and didn't understand while I was getting up. So they ended up offering to pay my client more money, a lot more money. <laughs> it, was, it was embarrassing for me getting up. It was good for my client. My client said, how did you ever think of that? I said, I had a knife going through my spine. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's a good story. I like that one. Uh, what are you most proud of? Most proud of? I'm very proud of uh, my colleagues. I'm very proud of my family. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, the relationships. When I was younger, I used to sit and read by myself a lot, especially you know when I was a toddler. My mother tells me I would be happy with a, just a book. And one of the things she would tell me, because I would be so happy just sitting there by myself and reading, is, you know, the world's not an island. You can't be an island. And taking off of that, I think the thing that I'm most proud of and gives me the greatest sense of satisfaction is, is the relationships I've built and helping others. I mean, all of this, uh, doing the things we do day to day and, you know, you try and help people. I love solving problems. I love helping people. But uh, the people that you get to meet and are fortunate enough to be a part of your life and work with, um, th that's where the fun is. That's where the humanity is. Uh, that, in the end, I think is what's really important. And, um, you know, I just, you hope that I know so many people have made a difference in my life and I just try to give back and hope that I can make a difference in, in some other folks lives. What's your favorite either business or non-business book? <laughs> I'm just going to say the dictionary. <laughs> the dictionary. Okay. I, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have a, a, a you know, a lot of favorites. I, I, I'll start and read a lot of books. I get bored easily. Oh, and if I, a book doesn't engage, if a book doesn't engage me, like I read all the time and my, my wife gives me a hard time because she says, you really need to let loose and just read novels, read things that'll take your mind away. And I read so much of, of my day that in, and both because I'm, I'm a, a business, I, I just love business. I can't read enough about business and businesses and things that our clients do. And, and, and uh, you know, I love the financial markets and, and, and following companies and see what they do and learning. So reading for pleasure is, is, is difficult. You know, I'll read a few newspapers a day and things and things sure, like that. Sure. But but other than that, it's tough. I would rather, much rather, if my mind's going to be taken away, I'd much rather watch some stupid romantic comedy or something <laughs> and just even starting it in the middle and just watching it out. for a half hour would zone be enough out. to zone out. You got it. All right. Last few for you. Um, what's the hardest business decision you've ever had to make? I think the hardest business decision I ever had to make um, is uh, to close an office. Certainly not an easy one. No, I, it's just it goes to, you know, you need to know what you're good at and where you can provide value. And you need to also admit uh, maybe where you make mistakes and uh what you can't do well. And I just want to continue doing things that 
you know, we do well. And that's that's really hard because you, uh, you know, it, it, it's a business decision. But for me, everything comes down to people. And when you really care about your people, um, that weighs hard and you lose a lot of sleep over things like that. Yeah, yeah, totally understandable. Uh, and maybe last two questions for you. Uh, who's the best mentor you've ever had? Wow. Um, I, I just have learned so much from, um, my parents and my grandmother. Um, I know uh, maybe they don't count as mentors and no, they certainly of course they didn't. Do. Uh, well, good. Uh, because that's probably where I've gotten the most. I've had professors that have been great friends and clients. I've had, I've, I've had, I've had teachers, you know, that I've learned along the way. Um, uh, I learn. I try and learn something from everybody. Um, so in many ways, so many people have contributed. It's difficult to to name folks. Uh, you know, beyond um, you know my my grandmother and my parents. But uh, you just. I try and I really do. I try and learn something from everyone. I try to have fun. I try to find humor in every situation, even if I keep that to myself. That that that's a that makes everything a lot more pleasant. And very last question for you. If you were doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing? That, that's a great question. I think about that sometimes. Um, sometimes I, you know, I'm a little wishful that uh, my, my, a lot of clients I've serviced over the years have told me that I should do for myself what I do for them. Uh people in the real estate business and the real estate investment and development business. So I think I could have seen myself as a real estate, you know, running a, a and owning a large real estate investment development company. I might have done that. And on the crazier side, uh, maybe hosted a, a good talk show. They seem to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Andrew, uh, thank you for even going over the time that uh, I agreed we would go for. Uh, but where can people My go pleasure, to learn? Jacob. Where can people go to learn more about you, Nixon Peabody? I mean, all the stuff that you're doing. I know you also write articles on LinkedIn periodically, uh, but anything you want to mention, please. Yeah, no, I have, um, people want to learn more about Nixon Peabody or me. I'm not sure why they'd want to learn more about me, but uh, we. it's all you need to do is uh, Google Nixon Peabody, www.nixonpeabody.com. If you Google Andrew Glencher, I'm sure... You'll find all sorts of interesting things that I don't even know are there. Uh, if you want to connect on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, just uh, reach out and uh, I'd be happy to communicate with folks. I've learned a lot. I've met up with old friends, new friends, and uh, it's much more valuable than I ever knew uh, social networking could be. So it's a, it is a part of my life. Well, thank you, Jacob. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so thank you much. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to be a guest. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. My guest, again, has been Andrew Glincher, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Partner at Nixon Peabody. I've been saying Peabody this whole time. So it's actually Nixon Peabody LLP. And I will see all of you guys next week.